Why are crocodiles and alligators such good hunters? One advantage crocodiles and alligators have over their enemies and prey is that they can grow to be fairly large. Alligators can be as big as 19 feet, almost 6 meters, and crocodiles. Considered the largest and heaviest living reptiles, can be slightly bigger. They have huge, crushing jaws and massive, powerful tails that help them swim and can be used to thrash their opponents. Perhaps their most useful feature as hunters is the positioning of their eyes and nostrils on the top of their heads. This trait allows alligators and crocodiles to keep most of their bodies submerged in the water. Hidden from view, while they wait for an animal to come to the water's edge for a drink. The water-loving reptiles can then snatch their prey. Pulling the animal into the water to drown it before eating it. Why do raccoons wash their food before they eat? Raccoons have small, slender feet that they use to catch and hold onto their food. Their front feet resemble little hands. And their slender fingers can be used to remove garbage can lids and open containers and even door latches. Raccoons in the wild have often been observed swishing their food through the water of a lake or stream before eating. Giving the appearance of washing their food and their hands. Raccoons kept in cages will also wet their food, dipping it into their water bowls. Scientists are not sure why raccoons exhibit this behavior. At one time they believed raccoons did not have enough saliva and needed to moisten their food before swallowing it. They now know that isn't true. Some believe raccoons might wet their food so they can mush it up a bit to make sure they've removed any sharp sticks or bones. Some have speculated that raccoons have a highly developed sense of touch. And they just like to handle their food in many different ways putting it in water. Rubbing dirt on it to figure out what it is they are eating. Sometimes raccoons have been seen washing food in dirt instead of water. Which indicates that this is an instinctive behavior that may not have any purpose at all. What does it mean to play possum? The opossum, whose name is frequently shortened to possum, is a small animal that spends a lot of its time in trees looking for food, insects, fruit, small birds, or mammals, and eggs. Its teeth and sharp claws help it get the food it needs. But in a contest with a larger predator, the opossum doesn't have many defenses. It does have one fairly effective trick, however, if an opossum is caught off guard on the ground by a potential enemy. It might pretend to be dead so the predator will leave it alone. Sometimes this works for the possum, and sometimes it doesn't. This behavior gave rise to the expression play possum. Which means to pretend to be sleeping or dead to avoid trouble. 
it can also generally refer to deceptive or dishonest behavior. Which lizard is the biggest? The Komodo dragon, part of the monitor family of lizards, is the largest living lizard. It can grow to be 10 feet, 3 meters, long, and it can weigh up to 300 pounds, 136 kilograms. The Komodo dragon has been known to attack and kill humans. And sometimes it will even eat members of its own species. But generally its diet consists of carrion, which is the flesh of animals that are already dead. Found on Komodo Island in Indonesia, this lizard has been popular with collectors of rare and exotic animals. And because of that the Komodo dragon is nearly extinct. The Komodo dragon is now protected by laws that prohibit people from hunting or capturing it. Why do giraffes have such long necks? Giraffes, the tallest of all animals, have such long necks because they eat leaves from the tops of some very high trees, beyond the reach of other animals. Living in the grasslands of Africa, they feed chiefly on acacia and mimosa trees. Using their long tongues and strong lips to pull off the highest leaves. A baby giraffe is about 6 feet, 1.8 meters, tall at birth, and a full-grown male giraffe can reach a height of 18 feet. 5.4 meters, from his hooves to the top of his head, about as high as a two-story house. A giraffe may have a neck that measures up to 7 feet, 2 meters, long. Still, giraffes have the same number of bones or vertebrae in. Their necks as we do the giraffe's bones are just much longer. Giraffes also have very long legs, which contribute to their great height. While their long legs allow them to outrun most of their enemies, they also cause a problem. Giraffes must spread their legs wide apart in order to reach anything on the ground, like water or grass. The position is an awkward one and leaves them vulnerable to attacks from predators. But they can protect themselves with their large hooves. Kicking a beast even as powerful as a lion to death. What is the difference between fur and hair? While there is some debate about this. Most scientists agree that there is no real difference between fur and hair. There are many different kinds of hair. The hair on a dog is different from the hair on a polar bear. Which is different from the hair on a person's head. And the hair on a person's head is different from the whiskers on a man's face. But it's... All hair. Many fur-covered animals actually have two different kinds of fur, the ground hair. Sometimes called secondary hair, which is the dense, soft undercoat of hair. And guard hair, also known as primary hair, which is the longer, coarser outer layer of fur. Ground hair helps the animal maintain its body temperature. 
while guard hair protects the ground hair from water, snow, or insects. Some animals, like certain kinds of lambs, only have ground hair. And some animals such as horses, primates. A group that includes people, and some dogs have only guard hair. Animal fur has long been used to create clothing for people. At one time, fur outerwear was necessary to protect people from harsh winter weather. In modern times, however, fur coats are a luxury item. Many of the animals whose fur is prized for its beauty and warmth like minks and Foxes are raised on fur ranches that were set up expressly to produce fur coats to sell. Do snakes have bones in their bodies? Snakes have such flexible and winding bodies. It seems strange to think that they have bones under those scales. Snakes do not have any arms or legs, but they do have bones in their skull, and they have a long backbone. The backbone is made up of vertebrae, plural of vertebra, the segments that make up the spinal column in all vertebrates. And a pair of ribs is attached to each vertebra above the tail section. Therefore, very long snakes have more vertebrae, and more ribs. Than any other kind of animal, some snakes have more than 400 vertebrae, people have 12. The way the vertebrae fit together allows for swiveling flexibility in both side to side and up and down motions. Allowing the snake to move the way it does without straining its skeleton. Why are there zoos? Zoological gardens commonly known as zoos were created for a number of reasons. Since ancient times people have captured wild animals for collections. For the pleasure of owning and observing them, and in order to learn more about them and their habits. Very few people can travel to the wilds of Africa and other exotic places. But by visiting a zoo they can see firsthand some of the world's huge variety of creatures. Today, most large cities have zoos. People can learn more about animals there and about how to protect the native habitats from which these creatures come. Many zoos are havens where endangered animals can live protected and where there are breeding. Programs that try to increase the population of such creatures to keep them from extinction. Zoos also provide homes for animals that have been injured and could no longer survive in the wild. Zoos both entertain and educate those who visit them. Why do porcupines have quills? The porcupine's quills are its best method of defending itself from predators. The sharp quills, which are modified hairs, are all over the porcupine's body, including its tail. When the North American porcupine, the most common species in the Americas, is threatened, it turns its tail toward the approaching animal. 
If attacked, this porcupine will thrash its predator with its tail. Thrusting its quills into the other animal's hide. Often some of the quills will come off the porcupine's tail. And their barbed ends, like a fish hook, will stay embedded in the attacker's skin. The average porcupine has around 30,000 quills. Porcupines are rodents, a group that makes up around half of all mammal species and includes mice, squirrels, and beavers. They are nocturnal, meaning active at night, and they eat tree bark, roots, and other vegetation. Their diet doesn't do much to satisfy their intense salt cravings. So porcupines have been known to chew on things like canoe paddles, animal bones, and even the discarded clothing of humans to get to the salt and oils in these items. How can mammals that live in the water sleep? Some marine mammals, like seals, climb out of the water to sleep. Others, like whales, cannot leave the water, for one thing, they cannot move on land. And for another, a large whale's body weight would crush its lungs if it were stuck on land. Therefore, many of these animals must sleep while in the water. But they also need to be alert enough to rise to the surface every so often to get a breath of air. Human beings, and many other animals, have an involuntary breathing system. Which means that we continue to breathe even when we are sleeping and not conscious of doing so. Scientists suspect that whales and dolphins have voluntary breathing. Which means they have to be somewhat alert to bring their blowholes to the surface and open and close them. In order to rest and yet still be conscious enough to breathe. Marine mammals must sleep lightly, many doing so while swimming slowly near the water's surface. When bottlenose dolphins sleep, half of their brain rests while the other half remains alert. And one eye stays open, to detect food or danger signs in the water. After a couple hours, it switches, with the other half resting and the first half staying awake. Sea cows and manatees, which usually live in warm, shallow water, float at the surface when they are resting. If the water is shallow enough, they can rest their bodies on the ocean bottom and keep their heads above water. Are there any poisonous lizards? Two lizards are known to inject venom into their prey, the Gila, pronounced he -h. Monster and the Mexican beaded lizard. The Gila, found in northern Mexico and the southwestern United States produces venom that is secreted into grooves in their teeth. When they bite into their prey, the venom gets into the other animal's blood. Around 20 inches, 50 centimeters, long, Gila monsters eat small mammals and birds as well as eggs. They have been known to bite people, but while their bites may be painful, they rarely cause serious harm to humans. The Mexican beaded lizard, a close relative to the Gila, 
can be a bit larger, around 31 inches, or 80 centimeters. It lives throughout much of Mexico and parts of Central America. Both of these lizards, during seasons when food is hard to find, can live for months off fat stored in their tails. Why do some animals carry their young around in pouches? Some mammals, like kangaroos, koalas, and possums, are called marsupials. When marsupial babies are born, they are incompletely developed. They continue developing outside the womb, in many cases living for a time in a pouch. A large fold of skin called a marsupium, on the mother's body. The marsupium keeps the developing baby warm and close to the mother's nipples. Where it can feed around the clock on the milk the mother produces. Most marsupial species are found in and around Australia, but several species, including the opossum, can be found in North and South America. How do whales and other mammals stay underwater so long? All aquatic mammals, meaning those that live in water, have lungs and require air to breathe. Some, like dolphins, live close to the water's surface and come up for air around once or twice a minute. Other sea mammals find their food by diving deep into the ocean. So they must be able to hold their breath for longer periods of time. They can do this because they take in a great deal of air with each breath their lungs take up a larger percentage of their body than do human lungs. Their bodies can also hold on to the oxygen they breathe better than human bodies can. Oxygen is required in every part of the body, for every bodily function. But when marine mammals go down for a deep dive, their oxygen is only sent to the most important parts, the heart, brain, and muscles used for swimming. The rest of the body the stomach, for example must wait until the dive is finished to get its oxygen. Human beings can hold their breath underwater for an average of one minute. A hippopotamus can stay underwater for 15 minutes. The sperm whale and bottlenose whale can stay underwater the longest. Some have been recorded on dives that lasted nearly two hours. Do bats really suck blood? There are more than 1,000 different kinds of bats. They live all over the world, except in the coldest regions. Most bats eat insects lots of them helping to protect food crops and other plant life. Some bats also eat fruit, as well as the nectar of flowers. There is only one kind of bat that drinks blood. Called the vampire bat, it lives in South America, Central America, and Mexico. Vampire bats are pretty small, their bodies only about 3 inches, 8 centimeters, long. They have big pointed ears and sharp teeth. 
which they use to quietly bite their victims while they are sleeping. In the saliva of the vampire bat is a substance known as an anticoagulant, which keeps the blood from clotting. They often bite livestock farm animals like horses and cows and they, like many types of bats, can spread rabies through their bites. Why do snakes shed their skins? Snakes grow rapidly when they are young, and they continue to grow throughout their lives. Their skin does not grow along with them, however. So they must shed their outer covering regularly, replacing it with a new, larger skin. Additionally, the scales covering a snake's body occasionally get damaged or wear out. All animals produce new cells to replace old, worn out parts of their outer covering. For snakes, the replacement process does not happen bit by bit. But all at once, in a process called molding, or shedding. When the new skin is ready, the outer layer begins to loosen. The snake's eyes turn a milky blue color because the skin covering the eye cap has loosened. To help get the molting started, the snake may rub its head against a rock, pulling the skin loose from its head. It then crawls completely out of its old skin, turning it inside out in the process and revealing its brand new skin. The new skin has the exact same pattern of scales as the old. Snakes shed more when they are young and growing quickly than when they get older. But on average a snake will molt between two and four times a year. How much food does an elephant eat each day? As the largest land animal, the elephant needs a lot of food to keep it going. An elephant eats all day long, browsing or grazing on vegetation like grasses, leaves, and fruit. It can consume hundreds of pounds of food each day. When available, and drink up to 50 gallons, 190 liters, of water. Elephants usually live in large herds, making it necessary to continuously travel over a large region. They are such big animals and big eaters. If they didn't keep moving they could easily strip an area of vegetation. Do any lizards live in water? Lizards need to breathe air, so there are no living species that live in water all of the time. Several species of lizards can and do swim. Spending part of their lives in the water looking for various freshwater organisms to eat. Only one species, the marine iguana of the Galapagos Islands, is known to get its food from salty seawater. It eats seaweed and algae, and some marine iguanas have been known to dive underwater in search of food for periods of up to half an hour. As they eat, marine iguanas naturally swallow lots of salt water, but they are able to remove the salt from their bodies because they 
like all iguanas, have salt glands between their eyes and nostrils. These glands concentrate and remove the salt, depositing it in the iguana's nostril. The lizard then gets rid of the salt by sneezing. The resulting bit of salt that shoots out of the iguana's nostril is used to scare off potential enemies. Why do snakes always stick out their tongues? Although a snake's forked tongue darting constantly in and out of its mouth can look scary. It is actually quite harmless. Snakes repeatedly stick out their tongues not because they're rude. But because they are using their tongues to gather information. Snakes have an organ located on the roof of their mouths called Jacobson's organ. This organ processes tiny amounts of chemical substances that are picked up by the snake's flicking tongue. Each time the tongue goes out of the snake's mouth, it picks up chemicals from the air. The snake then inserts the tips of its delicate forked tongue into the two openings of Jacobson's organ. Which can analyze the chemicals to tell if a nearby animal is potential food, or perhaps an enemy. Male snakes also use their tongues as part of a courting ritual, that is, the process by which they figure out if a certain female snake is interested in mating with them. The male snake jerks his body around, snapping his tongue in and out. And if the female ignores him, he knows to keep looking for a suitable partner. If she responds favorably, he's found his mate. Why are animals sometimes kept in cages at zoos? For many decades, most zoo animals were exhibited in cages with bars. It was a way to allow zoo visitors a good view of the animals while keeping people safe from unexpected attacks. Cages also kept animals in small areas, which was economical saving the zoo money and they were made of hard materials that could be hosed down, making them easy to keep clean. While cages are still used at zoos today, it is not often that an animal is kept in one all the time. Zoologists now realize that it is unhealthy and even cruel for an animal to always be confined to a cage where it cannot get the exercise it would ordinarily get in the wild. In recent years, Many zoos have built large enclosures for zoo animals that resemble the creature's own natural habitats. While zoo visitors may not be able to look as closely at an animal in such enclosures where a creature can hide in caves or trees the accommodations are much better for the animal which can now exhibit more natural behavior. Why are elephants hunted for their tusks? Elephants' tusks the huge, elongated pair of upper teeth that they use. For digging and fighting are the source of ivory, a hard 
creamy white material that has long been carved and polished to create beautiful objects. There are two types of ivory, live ivory, which is taken from a recently killed animal. And dead ivory, from an animal long dead, which is usually found on or buried in the ground. Dead ivory is harder and more brittle, cracking easily. Live ivory is more moist and easier to work with. The quest for live ivory has led to hundreds of thousands of elephants being killed for their tusks. Once very widespread, the world's elephant population has dwindled alarmingly because of the slaughter. But these great animals are now protected in many areas by strict laws that punish elephant hunters. Unfortunately, even the threat of punishment is not enough to stop some poachers. Or hunters who illegally kill protected animals. In spite of an international ban on the sale of elephant ivory. Hundreds of elephants are killed each year by people wanting to sell the ivory. How do boa constrictors kill their prey? Injecting animals with venom is not the only method used by snakes to control their prey. One group of snakes, called the constrictors, do not produce venom but are every bit as deadly to the animals they hunt. The constrictors, including boa constrictors and pythons, use the powerful muscles in their bodies to squeeze the life out of their prey. They coil themselves around the animal they've caught, squeezing until its blood can no longer circulate. Boa constrictors eat mostly birds and mice, and they can grow to be around 14 feet, 4.3 meters, long. The female boa is among the few snakes whose young develop within her body. She gives birth to live snakes, perhaps as many as 50 at one time. Pythons, which live in parts of Asia, Africa and Australia, are among the biggest snakes in the world. With the larger species getting as long as 30 feet, 9 meters. Why do rhinoceroses often have birds riding on their backs? The small birds seen on the huge backs of rhinos giant horned. Animals that come from Africa and southern Asia are called tick birds. These birds feed on the parasites or bugs hidden in the thick. Deeply folded skin of the large animals, keeping them clean and healthy. The cries of tick birds also warn rhinos when danger is approaching. Such warnings are helpful because rhinos have very bad eyesight. Do zoo animals hibernate? Animals that hibernate in the wild do so because temperatures drop and food supplies become scarce. In the zoo, however, animals live in a controlled environment. They are given a constant supply of food and warm pens. Or buildings to retreat to when it gets chilly outside. Some animals, including bears, may get sluggish during the coldest months at the zoo. 
but they will not spend months at a time sleeping as they might do in the wild. Is an elephant's trunk really its nose? Yes, an elephant breathes through its trunk, or proboscis, which has two nostrils through which air can pass. But an elephant's muscular trunk which nearly reaches the ground can do several other remarkable things. On the end of the trunk is a sensitive, finger-like lip or protuberance. An African elephant has two that can feel and pick up food and other objects. The end of an elephant's trunk is so sensitive that it can pick up a piece of thread from the floor. An elephant can also pick up and carry large things like logs by wrapping. Its strong trunk which contains hundreds of individual muscles around them. Because elephants are intelligent and easily trained. People have used them for centuries to do heavy work in certain parts of the world. An elephant can draw water up into its trunk and either release it into its mouth for a drink or shower it onto its back. It can do the same with dust and dirt, giving itself a soothing spray. An elephant also uses its trunk to make noise. The trumpeting sound we associate with elephants comes from its trunk. What is the smallest lizard? Geckos, sometimes spelled geckos, are the smallest types of lizards. They are only about 1 inch, 3 centimeters, long. Geckos got their name from the frequent chirping and clicking noises they make. Most reptiles don't make any noise at all. They like warm climates, and, unlike many other reptiles, they frequently live peacefully among humans probably because they are harmless. They are less threatening because of their small size, and their insect diet is helpful to humans. The tiny, hair-like coverings on their flattened feet make geckos extraordinary climbers. They are able to grip even very smooth surfaces. And they can climb straight up walls and even walk across ceilings. Why can't people pet the animals at the zoo? Most animals at a zoo have been captured from their natural habit. They are wild creatures unused to human contact, and their behavior is unpredictable. It isn't safe to pet most of the animals at the zoo because some might scratch or bite or attack. But many zoos have some animals that zoo officials know are safe to pet. They may be baby animals that have been raised in captivity by humans or types of animals known to be gentle. These animals are often put in petting zoos where visitors are allowed to touch and sometimes feed them. Why can't people pet the animals at the zoo?
Most animals at a zoo have been captured from their natural habit. They are wild creatures unused to human contact, and their behavior is unpredictable. It isn't safe to pet most of the animals at the zoo, because some might scratch or bite or attack. But many zoos have some animals that zoo officials know are safe to pet. They may be baby animals that have been raised in captivity by humans or types of animals known to be gentle. These animals are often put in petting zoos where visitors are allowed to touch and sometimes feed them. What are plants? Plants and animals make up almost all of the living things in the world. They are alike in a lot of ways. Both are made up of cells. Tiny building blocks of life that produce chemicals that control growth and activity. Often these cells become specialized in a plant or animal, with different types doing particular jobs. In addition, both plants and animals use gases, water, and minerals to carry on life processes. Both experience life cycles in which they are created, grow, reproduce, and die. But plants are very different from animals in one big way, most don't move around. Because they are rooted to one spot, plants are able to perform a special process called photosynthesis. For this remarkable process, plants use energy from sunlight. A gas in the air called carbon dioxide and water and minerals from soil to produce their own food. Animals can't do this, they must look for food. Eating plants or other animals in order to get the energy they need to live. The waste product produced by photosynthesis is oxygen, the gas that all animals need to breathe. So without plant life, there would be no animal life on Earth. And without plants around to absorb carbon dioxide, an excess amount of this gas would linger in our atmosphere. Trapping the sun's heat and causing an unwanted increase in the planet's average temperatures. Plants, then, are essential not only because they provide so much of the food we eat and provide nourishment for many of the animals we eat, but because they make our air healthier, using up carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. In addition, we depend on plants to provide us with other things we need. Like wood for building, fibers for making clothes, and medicines to improve our health. What are plants? Plants and animals make up almost all of the living things in the world. They are alike in a lot of ways. Both are made up of cells. Tiny building blocks of life that produce chemicals that control growth and activity. Often these cells become specialized in a plant or animal, with different types doing particular jobs. In addition, both plants and animals use gases, water, and minerals to carry on life processes. Both experience life cycles in which they are created, grow, reproduce, and die. But plants are very different from animals in one big way, most don't move around. 
because they are rooted to one spot, plants are able to perform a special process called photosynthesis. For this remarkable process, plants use energy from sunlight. A gas in the air called carbon dioxide and water and minerals from soil to produce their own food. Animals can't do this, they must look for food. Eating plants or other animals in order to get the energy they need to live. The waste product produced by photosynthesis is oxygen, the gas that all animals need to breathe. So without plant life, there would be no animal life on earth. And without plants around to absorb carbon dioxide, an excess amount of this gas would linger in our atmosphere. Trapping the sun's heat and causing an unwanted increase in the planet's average temperatures. Plants, then, are essential not only because they provide so much of the food we eat, and provide nourishment for many of the animals we eat. But because they make our air healthier, using up carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. In addition, we depend on plants to provide us with other things we need. Like wood for building, fibers for making clothes, and medicines to improve our health. How many different plants are there? Scientists have found and described more than 275,000 kinds of plants. But they believe that many more are yet to be discovered. Plants vary greatly in size and appearance. Some, like single cellulid algae, are so small that you can only see them with the help of a microscope. Others, like giant sequoia trees, are so big that you can't even see the tops of them. Plants are very different from one another because they have developed features over millions of years to help them live in the world's many different environments. How many different plants are there? Scientists have found and described more than 275,000 kinds of plants. But they believe that many more are yet to be discovered. Plants vary greatly in size and appearance. Some, like single cellulid algae, are so small that you can only see them with the help of a microscope. Others, like giant sequoia trees, are so big that you can't even see the tops of them. Plants are very different from one another because they have developed features over millions of years to help them live in the world's many different environments. What did the first plants look like? When you look at the green slime covering a still pond, you are looking at types of plants single cellulid green algae that are thought to be among the first that appeared on Earth. Though they share many characteristics, some scientists do not actually classify algae as plants, but as part of the kingdom Protista. About 630 million years ago plants like these first grew. 
in the oceans and spread to other watery environments. While they have no roots, stems, or leaves, algae do contain chlorophyll and make their own food through. Photosynthesis using the energy of the sun, carbon dioxide, and water and give off the waste gas oxygen. Because so much of Earth's surface is covered with water. Algae including seaweeds are a major source of the oxygen we breathe. Over time, plants with more complex parts evolved and eventually adapted to life on land. Beginning about 400 million years ago. What did the first plants look like? When you look at the green slime covering a still pond. You are looking at types of plants single celled green algae that are thought to be among the first that appeared on earth. Though they share many characteristics. Some scientists do not actually classify algae as plants, but as part of the kingdom Protista. About 630 million years ago plants like these first grew in the oceans and spread to other watery environments. While they have no roots, stems, or leaves, algae do contain chlorophyll and make their own food through. Photosynthesis using the energy of the sun, carbon dioxide, and water and give off the waste gas oxygen. Because so much of Earth's surface is covered with water. Algae including seaweeds are a major source of the oxygen we breathe. Over time, plants with more complex parts evolved and eventually adapted to life on land. Beginning about 400 million years ago. What do plants eat? Plants really don't eat in the way that animals eat. What do plants eat? Plants really don't eat in the way that animals eat. A better question would be, how do plants make their own food? Green plants get nourishment through a chemical process called photosynthesis, which uses sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to make simple sugars. Those simple sugars are then changed into starches, proteins, or fats, which provide a plant with all the energy it needs to perform life processes and to grow. Generally, sunlight, along with carbon dioxide, enters through the surface of a plant's leaves. The sunlight and carbon dioxide travel to special food-making cells, palisade, deeper in the leaves. Each of these cells contain a green substance called chlorophyll which gives plants. Their green color that traps light energy, allowing food making to take place. Also located in the middle layer of leaves are special cells that make up a plant's transportation systems. Tube-like bundles of cells called xylem tissue carry 
water and minerals throughout a plant, from its roots to its outermost leaves. Phloem cells, on the other hand, transport the plant's food supply sugar. Dissolved in water from its manufacturing site in leaves to all other cells. The plant food that we buy in stores is simply a mixture of minerals that plants need to grow well. These include nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Usually a plant is able to get these things from the soil in which it grows. Drawing them up with water through its roots. But gardeners, farmers, and other plant growers add to this natural mineral supply so plants can thrive. A better question would be, how do plants make their own food? Green plants get nourishment through a chemical process called photosynthesis, which uses sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to make simple sugars. Those simple sugars are then changed into starches, proteins, or fats, which provide a plant with all the energy it needs to perform life processes and to grow. Generally, sunlight, along with carbon dioxide, enters through the surface of a plant's leaves. The sunlight and carbon dioxide travel to special food-making cells, palisade, deeper in the leaves. Each of these cells contain a green substance called chlorophyll which gives plants. Their green color that traps light energy, allowing food making to take place. Also located in the middle layer of leaves are special cells that make up a plant's transportation systems. Tube-like bundles of cells called xylem tissue carry water and minerals throughout a plant, from its roots to its outermost leaves. Phloem cells, on the other hand, transport the plant's food supply sugar. Dissolved in water from its manufacturing site in leaves to all other cells. The plant food that we buy in stores is simply a mixture of minerals that plants need to grow well. These include nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Usually a plant is able to get these things from the soil in which it grows. Drawing them up with water through its roots. But gardeners, farmers, and other plant growers add to this natural mineral supply so plants can thrive. If a plant isn't green, can it still perform photosynthesis? Many plants contain other pigments in addition to the green pigment chlorophyll, which traps light energy for photosynthesis. These other pigments can mask chlorophyll's green color. So the leaves and stems of such plants may appear red, purple, or even brown. But these plants still contain chlorophyll and can still use photosynthesis to produce food. If a plant isn't green, can it still perform photosynthesis? Many plants contain other pigments in addition to the green pigment chlorophyll, 
which traps light energy for photosynthesis. These other pigments can mask chlorophyll's green color. So the leaves and stems of such plants may appear red, purple, or even brown. But these plants still contain chlorophyll and can still use photosynthesis to produce food. How do plants grow? Special cells in plants produce hormones. Chemical messengers that tell different plant cells to perform certain activities. Plant hormones are responsible for things like fruit development. The death of flower petals and leaves, and, most importantly, for growth. Cells in stem tips, new leaves, and buds, for instance. Produce various growth hormones that tell plant cells to multiply by division or to become larger. The pattern of growth in plants offers an important example of how they differ from animals. While animals eventually become fully grown, and live for a long time after that point. Plants never stop growing throughout their life cycles. In other words, there is no such thing as an adult plant that no longer grows but continues to live. How do plants grow? Special cells in plants produce hormones. Chemical messengers that tell different plant cells to perform certain activities. Plant hormones are responsible for things like fruit development. The death of flower petals and leaves, and, most importantly, for growth. Cells in stem tips, new leaves, and buds, for instance. Produce various growth hormones that tell plant cells to multiply by division or to become larger. The pattern of growth in plants offers an important example of how they differ from animals. While animals eventually become fully grown, and live for a long time after that point. Plants never stop growing throughout their life cycles. In other words, there is no such thing as an adult plant that no longer grows but continues to live. Why do plants grow toward light? A plant's ability to make food depends on its ability to absorb enough light energy. So, many plants move in the small ways that they can toward the sun or other light sources. A characteristic known as phototroism. Some plants hold their leaves flat and open during the day to Catch as many of the sun's rays as possible and close them at night. Other plants change the direction their leaves face throughout the day. Following the path of the sun as it moves across the sky. When a plant grows in uneven sunlight with the light hitting just one side of the plant. Let's say chemical messengers called hormones will cause more stems and leaves to grow on the lighted side so that the plant can gather enough of the sunlight it needs to make food. Phototroism explains why house plants turn their leaves toward windows. 
growing into lopsided shapes unless they are rotated once in a while. Why do plants grow toward light? A plant's ability to make food depends on its ability to absorb enough light energy. So, many plants move in the small ways that they can toward the sun or other light sources. A characteristic known as phototroism. Some plants hold their leaves flat and open during the day to catch as many of the sun's rays as possible and close them at night. Other plants change the direction their leaves face throughout the day. Following the path of the sun as it moves across the sky. When a plant grows in uneven sunlight with the light hitting just one side of the plant. Let's say chemical messengers called hormones will cause more stems and leaves to grow on the lighted side so that the plant can gather enough of the sunlight it needs to make food. Phototroism explains why house plants turn their leaves toward windows, growing into lopsided shapes unless they are rotated once in a while. Why do plants sometimes wilt in the sun? In order to take in and get rid of the gases carbon dioxide and oxygen involved in food production, plants have thousands of microscopic openings called stomata on their leaves and stems. Most of the stomata are located on the underside of leaves. A leaf on a cucumber plant has 60,000 stomata in just over one tenth of a square inch. One square centimeter. Water that circulates throughout a plant escapes through. These many openings in a process called transpiration. Usually a plant takes up more water through its roots than it loses through its leaves. And it is able to keep its firm shape. But on a hot, dry, or windy day, a plant can lose a lot of water through its leaves. At a much faster rate than it can take it in. On such days, wilting can occur. Water pressure in plant cells helps give plants their form. Without that pressure, the cells shrink, causing a plant to wilt. At night, when there is no sunlight for photosynthesis, the stomata on plants are closed by special guard cells that surround their openings. Little transpiration occurs then, and a plant can refill its supply of water through its roots. Water pressure will return to normal in plant cells, then. Along with the normal shape and appearance of the plant. Why do plants sometimes wilt in the sun? In order to take in and get rid of the gases carbon dioxide and oxygen involved in food production. Plants have thousands of microscopic openings called stomata on their leaves and stems. Most of the stomata are located on the underside of leaves. A leaf on a cucumber plant has 60,000 stomata in just over one tenth of a square inch. One square centimeter. 
water that circulates throughout a plant escapes through. These many openings in a process called transpiration. Usually a plant takes up more water through its roots than it loses through its leaves. And it is able to keep its firm shape. But on a hot, dry, or windy day, a plant can lose a lot of water through its leaves. At a much faster rate than it can take it in. On such days, wilting can occur. Water pressure in plant cells helps give plants their form. Without that pressure, the cells shrink, causing a plant to wilt. At night, when there is no sunlight for photosynthesis. The stomata on plants are closed by special guard cells that surround their openings. Little transpiration occurs then, and a plant can refill its supply of water through its roots. Water pressure will return to normal in plant cells, then. Along with the normal shape and appearance of the plant. Do all plants have roots? The simplest types of plants don't have roots. Single celled green algae, for instance, float on water surfaces. As do many types of seaweed, which are larger types of algae. Those seaweeds that do cling to the seabed do so through growths called steadfasts, which are not true roots. Seaweed absorbs water and minerals from the sea through all its parts. Similarly, simple plants like mosses form low-growing mats in damp places. Soaking up the moisture they need directly from their environment. Instead of roots they have thread-like growths called rhizoids that anchor them to rocks or trees. More complex forms of plants, though, like ferns, conifers, cone-bearing plants, and flowering plants, all have true roots and stems an internal transportation system that can move water and minerals from their source to wherever they are needed. Land plants have two types of roots, tap roots and fibrous roots. A plant's root type is often determined by its water source. A tap root is a large, single root that grows straight down to reach water deep in the soil. With smaller roots branching off of it. Fibrous roots have no main root but spread out in a wide web to gather water located in the top layers of soil. In places like rainforests where there is abundant plant growth with little ground space for roots and plenty of moisture some plants grow high up in trees. These epiphytes, or air plants, have fibrous, spongy, aerial roots that get moisture from the frequent rains and take minerals from the surface of the tree on which they grow or from the plant debris that gathers around their roots. Many orchids are epiphytic plants. Do all plants have roots? The simplest types of plants don't have roots. Single celled green algae, for instance, float on water surfaces. As do many types of seaweed, which are larger types of algae. 
Those seaweeds that do cling to the seabed do so through growths called steadfasts, which are not true roots. Seaweed absorbs water and minerals from the sea through all its parts. Similarly, simple plants like mosses form low growing mats in damp places. Soaking up the moisture they need directly from their environment. Instead of roots they have thread-like growths called rhizoids that anchor them to rocks or trees. More complex forms of plants, though, like ferns, conifers, cone-bearing plants, and flowering plants, all have true roots and stems an internal transportation system that can move water and minerals from their source to wherever they are needed. Land plants have two types of roots, tap roots and fibrous roots. A plant's root type is often determined by its water source. A tap root is a large, single root that grows straight down to reach water deep in the soil. With smaller roots branching off of it. Fibrous roots have no main root but spread out in a wide web to gather water located in the top layers of soil. In places like rainforests where there is abundant plant growth with little ground space for roots and plenty of moisture some plants grow high up in trees. These epiphytes, or air plants, have fibrous, spongy, aerial roots that get moisture from the frequent rains and take minerals from the surface of the tree on which they grow or from the plant debris that gathers around their roots. Many orchids are epiphytic plants. Do all plants have leaves? The simplest types of plants, like algae, don't have leaves. But they do have chlorophyll in their cells and make their own food through photosynthesis. Using sunlight, water, and minerals. Mosses have leaf-like structures that carry out photosynthesis. But they are not true leaves because they don't have the special tissues xylem and phloem that distribute food water, and minerals throughout most plants. The lack of a transportation system is the reason that mosses are so tiny and low to the ground. More complex types of plants have leaves. Leaf shape is often determined by conditions in the environment. Usually, where sunlight and water are plentiful, leaves are flat and broad. Providing a large surface area where photosynthesis can take place. Where weather is cold and dry, however, water loss can be a problem. The long, needle shaped leaves of conifer trees, including pines, for example, help retain water. Allowing the plants to grow in very dry, cold places, far north or high in the mountains. The extreme environment of the desert intensely hot and dry has brought about other special leaf adaptations. Many desert plants have fleshy leaves and stems in which they are able to store large amounts of water. Over millions of years the leaves of desert cactus plants became so small to Restrict water loss through transpiration that on many only sharp spines remain. The thick skin stems or branches of cactus plants now do the job that leaves do for other plants. 
making food through photosynthesis. Do all plants have leaves? The simplest types of plants, like algae, don't have leaves. But they do have chlorophyll in their cells and make their own food through photosynthesis. Using sunlight, water, and minerals. Mosses have leaf-like structures that carry out photosynthesis. But they are not true leaves because they don't have the special tissues xylem and phloem that distribute food, water, and minerals throughout most plants. The lack of a transportation system is the reason that mosses are so tiny and low to the ground. More complex types of plants have leaves. Leaf shape is often determined by conditions in the environment. Usually, where sunlight and water are plentiful, leaves are flat and broad. Providing a large surface area where photosynthesis can take place. Where weather is cold and dry, however, water loss can be a problem. The long, needle-shaped leaves of conifer trees, including pines, for example, help retain water. Allowing the plants to grow in very dry, cold places, far north or high in the mountains. The extreme environment of the desert intensely hot. And dry has brought about other special leaf adaptations. Many desert plants have fleshy leaves, and stems, in which they are able to store large amounts of water. Over millions of years the leaves of desert cactus plants became so small to restrict water loss through transpiration that on many only sharp spines remain. The thick skin stems or branches of cactus plants now do the job that leaves do for other plants. Making food through photosynthesis. What is an amphibian? Amphibians are cold blooded vertebrates that spend part of their lives in bodies of water or watery places, and part on land. The name comes from the Greek word amphibios, which means living a double life. This class includes frogs and toads, salamanders, and Sicilians, which look like large earthworms. Amphibians start out as eggs that are usually laid and hatched in water or moist ground. And the early stage of most amphibians' lives are spent in the water. Baby amphibians, called larvae, don't resemble the adults at all. As they mature, they go through major changes, called a metamorphosis. Adult amphibians usually live on land. Never straying far from the water and returning to it when it's time to breed. Frogs and toads, for example, emerge from their eggs as tadpoles. Sometimes called polywogs, little creatures with a rounded head and a tail. They have gills for breathing in water and cannot survive on land. Over time, the gills become air-breathing lungs, the tail disappears, and limbs develop. Adult frogs and toads may spend a good amount of time in and around water. But they need air in order to breathe. 
Not every amphibian follows the usual pattern of spending. The larval stage in water and the adult stage on land. As with every part of the animal kingdom, there are some creatures that don't fit the mold. For instance, some tree frogs living in tropical regions never leave their leafy homes. Their eggs must be kept moist, however. So the female frogs lay them in the drops of water that gather on the tree's leaves after a rain. For the most part amphibians are fairly small creatures, with most being only a few inches long. The smallest frog in the world is no bigger than a person's thumbnail. The largest amphibian is the Chinese giant salamander, which can be around 5 feet, 1.5 meters, long. Amphibians do not have scales, plates, or fur their skin is usually smooth. With some toads being notable exceptions, and moist. In addition to breathing through their lungs. Amphibians breathe through their skin, and that moistness is necessary for them to do so. To make sure their skin stays moist. Amphibians secrete a fluid that spreads over their skin and locks in moisture. How can animals live in a desert? The harsh conditions of desert life present many problems for the animals living there, temperatures get extremely high. Water is scarce, and food supplies, whether in the form of plants or other animals, dwindle. Desert animals have developed numerous techniques, however, to adapt to their unique climate. Just as animals living in cold climates hibernate in winter. So do some desert animals live through dry periods by becoming dormant, or inactive. Desert toads bury themselves deep in the ground. Emerging only after a rainfall to get water and food and to breed. Many desert animals live in underground burrows or in caves, such animals spend hot. Dry days in their dens, away from the sun, coming out in the early morning or at night when it's cooler. Several desert animals are especially equipped to handle hotter temperatures. The large ears of jackrabbits can release heat while they rest in the shade. Owls and some other birds release body heat through their open mouths. Letting their saliva evaporate to cool down their bodies. Many desert residents have pale fur, feathers, scales, or skin. An adaptation that means they absorb less of the sun's heat. They also blend in better with their sandy surroundings, which means they are less visible to predators. The meat eaters in the desert can sometimes get all of the moisture they need from eating their prey. Or, in the case of vultures, from eating carrion, or the flesh of already dead animals. Other desert animals are able to conserve the moisture they do get in amazing ways. The kangaroo rat, for example, can actually create water from the dry seeds it eats. And its kidneys can remove most of the water from its urine, sending the water back through the rat's bloodstream. Thanks to their ability to fly. Birds probably have the easiest time escaping the desert's difficult conditions. They can fly great distances if necessary to find areas where rain has fallen and vegetation is growing. 
large-winged birds can spend the hottest part of the day soaring way up high where the winds are cooler.